Hello, all my sweet listeners. Thank you for downloading and tuning in. Welcome to the Jimmy Curve Podcast. I am your host, Jimmy Putnam. Thank you so much for listening. With me, as always, are my co-hosts in the correct order this week, Joshua Vossler. Hello, everybody. And William Doherty. Last is best. (laughs) All right. We've got a good show for you today. We're going to be talking a lot about music. We're going to address some Facebook drama. That ought to be fun. Uh, And we're going to get to some news and some current events with Joshua Vossler at the end of the show. That song you heard at the beginning was called Fly on the Wall. It was by local band Monty Peck and the Hanyaks. And joining us today, the very same Monty Peck. Hello, Monty. Hello, 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 hello. Did I get it right this time? Hanyaks? Hanyaks. All right, Monty. uh, Monty, I know you from uh, hosting, organizing, running the open stage uh, and open mic events on Wednesdays and Thursday nights at Dugan's Pub in Lincoln, Nebraska. That is correct. You do. And uh, as far as I know, that defines you as a person. (laughs) (laughs) If you say so. If you say so. (laughs) I don't. I certainly don't. Uh, Give us a little history. I know that you're a musician. Mm -hmm. You've dabbled in comedy. We talk a lot about comedy on this show. So I dibbled, dabbled. Yeah, a little bit dribbled, here and there. Dribbled. Dribbled, dribbled in it. Right, a little, little post-comedy like, dribble. Dri- dribble on me. Yeah. Right. That, that, that's actually a prostate issue, but yeah. uh, when you, uh, your, your musical history, how long have you been playing? You play, you play, as far as I know, every instrument. That is also correct, yes. <laughs> right. Like, I've seen you jam uh, on the open stage and just kind of make the, the circuit around the instruments. It's fun. It's, it's good to be able to do that and, you know, fit in where you can get in. So, uh, how long have you been playing music? Where did it get started for you? Do you come from a musical family? You know, I do not come from a musical family. I I don't have anyone else in uh, my family that's even relatively musical. I think my mom can sing, but uh, my brother plays drums. That's only because I made him. Right. But, you know. You are one singing mother ahead of me. Uh, Mm -hmm. I kind of had the same thing, which is that no one in my family really has any musical ability or really is interested at all like my parents did the same thing did the the thing with me when i was young where they were like you should take piano lessons but i think that was only because they thought it sounded like a good idea they weren't really invested and when 12 year old jimmy was like man that sounds no fun at all like they were like okay fine don't but now i really wish i would have because Boy, was it an uphill climb to learn music at the age of 18. (laughs) Like, I've always had some sort of musical ability, but as I get older, I don't know, as I get older, I just really wish I could play the accordion. Does that sound weird? (laughs) Yes. Uh, That sounds weird? The accordion could be probably pretty cool. Do you like Zydeco music? Yeah. (laughs) You're the one. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, Yeah, Zydeco music is bad. Anyways, uh, <laughs> I'd like to see that sometime, Josh. I'd like to see you play the accordion. Oh, I wish I, I had any like a talent to do well, that. The accordion, though, is where the two loves of my life, other than people, specific people. Anyways, the two loves of my life meet, which is at Weird Al Yankovic, which is music and comedy. Oh, me? Okay. I thought you as you were listing the two loves of your life, the first one was meat. <laughs> the two loves of my life, meat and parody songs. M- me- <laughs> meat is more of a passion than a true love. Uh, right. You know. Meat is a weekend fling. Well, he, <laughs> what? music and comedy aren't killing me right. as fast. Like, you have comedians that play the guitar. They don't sing, but they just tell jokes over guitar playing. Right. Okay, picture that. Yeah, like Zach Galifianakis does with a piano. Right. Picture that. I am. But with accordion. It's oh, it's awful. Oh, yeah? <laughs> <laughs> that sounds bad. <laughs> <laughs> so where did it start for you, Monty? Like, where... probably around the age of uh, probably around the age of fourteen. Nice. I uh, was playing football. Where are you from? I'm actually from a small town in South Texas. Mm. Very small town, like a blink and you miss it town on the way through. Right. Um, very small town, Howlettsville, Texas. Okay. What 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 huge city is that close to? Mm, that's a good question. It's not really close to any of them, but if you know your Texas geography, which most people do not up here. No. Um, <clears throat> somewhere between Austin, San Antonio, Corpus, and Houston, smack dab right in the middle. Awesome. It sounds like a good place to do some nuclear testing. 
It probably would be. <laughs> I I would sign the petition. If, <laughs> totally. No, actually, I, I I've been playing long for longer than I haven't at this point. Okay. And uh, started around you know fourteen. I was playing football. Uh, broke my legs, and so that kind of ended the whole sports thing for me at that point. Broke so. your legs playing football? Yeah. Jesus. Well, broke Wait. one and then had a resulting injury because of that broken one, which oh, is man. a real good story. <laughs> Okay, good. I was going to say, I was going to be real excited if I was talking to the guy who managed to break both of his legs playing football. No. <laughs> like, I do, I've never loved football that much. <laughs> so, yeah, I, I broke a leg, and then a resulting injury from breaking that leg, I was confined to a wheelchair for a while. Once I was in the wheelchair, I started playing guitar, then just it kind of took off from there. I just kept playing. I learned practically every Nirvana song, Yeah, as most people did at that point in time. <laughs> right. Um, but, yeah, and... Just I kept playing and playing and playing and kept playing. I've been in and out of bands ever since I was, I guess, 16 or so. I feel like and we're about the same age. I'm 36. I, I will be 35 in three days. Okay, good. Is oh, it, happy birthday. Hey, thanks. Thank you. <laughs> Wait, Is what's it, today? Today's the 15th, right? I don't know. <laughs> I think it's the 15th. Probably. So... So is it safe to say that at a fairly early age you discovered that, like, music would allow you to get laid without taking care of yourself? Yes. <laughs> There's, yeah, no debate. Absolutely. Much like comedy's done for you, Will. Um, I've been in one relationship for my entire life. I've never done comedy to try to have sex with someone. <laughs> I've never done anything to try to have sex with someone. Oh, uh. listen to this guy. <laughs> well, I, I I'm the same as Will, though. Like, I've been in a relationship for 20 years now. <laughs> well, 16. Uh, yeah. A I'm, long time. I'm married, and I have to do a lot to get laid. <laughs> so I don't know what you're talking about. So, like, I really do like musical comedy, and I've always wanted to try some. But it feels super hard to do that well. It feels like it's really easy to write, like, a three-chord rock song and play it in a way that some people will find entertaining like musical comedy is really hard it's what's funny about musical comedy is that there are like six people on the planet doing it well <laughs> and that's about it i mean how many people can you name that consistently you know there's like weird al yankovic garfunkel and oats the book of mormon and that's like it <laughs> i don't know i think adam levine's pretty funny <laughs> I, I, You're not a big fan. <laughs> no. Okay, wait, hold on. Who is that? Singer of Maroon Five. I think it's Avril Lavigne's brother. <laughs> Actually, I'm not sure. I don't know any of these. They people. might be related. They both stink. <laughs> the guitar player for Maroon Five went to my high school. Yeah, that is all. <laughs> yeah, he's it the guy sucks. from Maroon Five. That's the Adam Lavigne, the guy that's on The Voice, yeah. the guy who can't sing but yet judges people. On their voice, he sings really high. And yeah. Like, yeah. Okay. Well, auto tune helps him sing there. Yeah. All right. Yeah. You didn't like Maroon 5's Maroon Five's like first album. Mm -mm. Oh, you didn't like. Oh, you didn't no. like it from the start. No. You just you knew from the start this band's bullshit. Yes. You kind of knew where they were going, and mm -hmm. that's where they are today, which is a total fucking sellout piece yep. of band. Yep. <laughs> hey, they had the money, so apparently they're doing something hey. right. You know. Yay, Maroon 5. Maybe they'll, <laughs> maybe they'll make an appearance in an upcoming Slot 40. Do they still put out songs? I don't know. I don't know nothing they do, by them. And they have a terrible song on the radio right now. Yeah, nice. It's pretty bad. <laughs> Sing us a few bars, Will. Oh, God. Isn't that that animal song? Yeah. Animals. Just like animals, like animals, like animals, man. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that, he pretty much just summed it up. Though. There it is. Oh. That was beautiful. Actually, that sounded gotta, better than Maroon 5. <laughs> we got to start videoing this and Thank putting you. it up just for Will's uh, shaking his tits. Yeah, Will did a, a really nice, like, shimmy there. It was like, I think I've seen guys in the NBA do that move after dunking. Like, the end of the shoulder shimmy move. It's a visual gag for everyone uh, not paying attention. Let's, what, Monty, give me, give me your five favorite bands. I know that's an impossible question, but just like. No, it's not impossible. Awesome. You've got it. You got five it. five favorite bands. Yeah. In no particular order or possibly a particular order. Let's find out. Okay. The Beatles. 
N- okay. Okay. And I don't. And hold on. Let me. Let me just go ahead and say. Check it. that box. I'm not <laughs> saying. Uh huh. Exactly. I'm not saying the Beatles because it's in vogue to say you like the Beatles. I actually really, really like the Beatles. Can I tell you something? A little bit too much, I think. Can I tell you something? I respect the Beatles. I get how important they are. I do not dig them. Yeah. I love not for music. Well, it is. It's so weird, and mu- people get so intensely passionate about music. I mean, that's the point of it. Is that it's supposed to inspire like intense emotions. Right, right. And but like, if you're like, nah, I don't really care for the Beatles. Like, there are people who will get really offended and hurt. Oh, like, yeah. who will attack well, you? I, I don't hate them if they're on the radio. I don't dive for the right. channel. Like, no. Well, I think but, I think that's the difference right there. When people are claim claim to be inspired by the Beatles. I, I don't think I could ever really claim to be inspired by them. Right. I just enjoy the music. Right. Um, also, uh, number two, Soundgarden. I've always liked Soundgarden. Oh, fantastic. Definitely a band, you know, kind Un- of the Underrated thing. band. They get lost in the whole, like, Nirvana yeah. Pearl Jam shuffle, but Soundgarden. It's unfortunate. And then, uh, I fucking love, what was the next Chris Cornell project? Uh, Audio Slave. Yeah. That was a good Awesome. Band. Yeah. Again, not, love it. Audio Slave. Not one of my favorites, right. but uh, let's go with number three. Cool. Uh, little known band, Super Drag. I don't know if you've ever heard of a band called Who Super Drag. Who sucked out yeah. with the feeling? Right I fucking love that song. One song. That is in my- One song. It's the only one I know by them, but it's in my it's in every playlist in my iPhone. Right on. Yeah, <laughs> I totally I totally love their entire catalog. Their second record's killer, man. It's yeah? a killer record. Yep. They, just released, they just re-released it on vinyl, I think, for the, uh, I guess, the 20-year anniversary. Not, well- no, 15 year anniversary, I believe. What was the band? Hold on a second. I'm just, I'm gonna stop you for a second. Okay. This I've is still what, got this two more. I'm, I got I can count. This is the format of the show: is I ask people a question and then I interrupt and I talk for like 10 minutes. But like, what is the <laughs> what? There was a band that was formed out of like all of the grunge bands in the early 90s, and they came together and formed like a like, and they released one album. Do you know what I'm talking about? There was a lot of people like that. I think Chris Cornell was involved in that. I think he was the singer, and I think it had some Pearl Jam guys. Okay, well, what am I t- thinking of Audio Slave? No, I know what you're thinking of, and that particular band was formed for a different reason. Um, I could go into the whole backstory; it might take a while. But the <laughs> name of the band you're talking about is Temple of the Dog. That's what I'm thinking of. Yep. Yes. Uh, that, what was their hit? Uh, Hunger Strike. That's the one. But it was, and now also they had another couple singles. I think "Say Hello to Heaven" was a single, but only because. Uh, Chris Cornell wrote all those songs about uh, his roommate at the time who was the front man of a band in Seattle called Mother Love Bone. The guy's right. name was Andrew Wood. He OD'd, and uh, he died, and they were best friends, and he wrote all these songs, but they didn't quite lend themselves to what Soundgarden was doing. Oh. So he got together with the other rem- mem- the remaining members of Mother Love Bone who were- In Pearl Jam. What were about to become Pearl Jam. Oh. So the first song Eddie Vedder ever appeared on was Hunger Strike. Really? Yeah. I feel, that's crazy. And then after crazy. that, they became a band, and Pearl Jam went out their way at Soundgarden. They're all big friends. And yeah. See, I, I, I'm remembering this poorly because I would have told you that Pearl Jam had been around for like a while mm-hmm. at this point, but that's not true. Nope. Because Hunger Strike is a fucking awesome song. It is. I'm a child of grunge. Like no, that's, that's the era that I come from. Absolutely. It's it was good stuff. Weaned on it. But I hate Ween. Anyways, you've got two more bands. Uh, Ween. No, actually, <laughs> no. That would if no. I can't say that. Uh, actually, there is a Ween record that's r- hilarious. You talk about comedy music. Yeah. Uh, I don't know if they do it particularly well, but there is a Ween record called Twelve Golden Country Greats, which is fucking hilarious, man. It just sucks. It's just a. F- it's a funny record, man. Come on now. That's no, fine. Do you have to listen to it? But you won't, so that's okay. Uh, the other two bands. Yeah, let's do um, it. Always uh, been a big fan of Smashing Pumpkins up until recently. Uh, yeah, he's he's gone. God, too I was far. with you so, on all of these. I was so with you. Yeah, he's gone too far these days. I can't <laughs> I can't get behind Billy Corgan anymore. I just can't do it, man. I, he was on Howard Stern last week. Oh, and yeah. I've never heard somebody so pretentious. Yeah, for real. He needs to stop life. it, man. He's so bitter and pissed off about not being as famous as he thinks he should be it's so dumb man he's had a great recording career just shut up he was talking shit about foo fighters of course he was (laughs) and that brings me to my next favorite band foo fighters i yes i've said for years foo fighters my favorite thing about nirvana okay absolute favorite thing well objectively it's better music i mean i love nirvana i fuck like those songs are just great i mean they're killer but like foo fighters is an awesome band. Hell yeah, it is. And they're not, not a grunge band. They're just a kick-ass rock and roll yep. group. And, like, man, they have fun. Like, the fun that they have being them, you can really feel it, and mm-hmm. you start having fun listening to it. I've always, I just, I, I dig Foo Fighters as well, man. Um, they're a good band. 
Let's get back to Smashing Pumpkins. They headlined the first ever all-day outdoor concert festival I ever went to, which was a Lollapalooza. It was headlined by Smashing Pumpkins and Beastie Boys. And uh, we left right before Smashing Pumpkins because that's how much I disliked them. When was this? Was this after or before MCA died? Uh, this was, oh, yeah, well before. Is MCA dead? Yeah. One of the Beastie Boys died? Yeah. When did dude. that happen? A few years ago. I think there's only one left. Oh, this was, this, this was. Well, the other one's probably missing. So he's probably in Tibet or somewhere. <laughs> this was 15 years ago. Oh, no, they were, no, this was, long, I was in high school. I was, this was 20 years ago. Yeah, he probably didn't have cancer by that point. Right. I didn't even know he had cancer. Are you making this up? No. <laughs> I didn't Heavens know anything. No, no MCA is. Oh, he, he that's has, sad. He has passed on. That's sad. Yeah. I know that one of the other bo- Beastie Boys is Neil Diamond's son. Is that Mike D? Yeah. Really? Mike Diamond. Oh, wow. Yeah. Well, I guess it makes sense. And his brother is Dustin Diamond, who played Screech. No way. <laughs> That's 100% true. Are you making this up? <laughs> That's crazy. Go online. No, I'm and, asking the questions. Go online and search for pictures of Mike D and <laughs> Dustin Diamond. They look identical. So you find some family pictures. They fuck. They look. They they look exactly alike. Jimmy Curve Fact Check. Time to check some facts. This is a Jimmy Curve Fact Check interruption. Neither Neil Diamond, Mike Diamond, better known as Mike D, nor Dustin Diamond, better known as Screech, are in any way related to one another. This has been a Jimmy Curve Fact Check interruption. Now back to the show. Jimmy Curve Fact Check. Time to check some facts. Uh, Will Doherty, five favorite bands. Oh, God, this is so embarrassing. Um, I don't know anything about music, and this is what I say. Probably my favorite band is, like, Bare Naked Ladies. Cool. Great band. Really? Hell yeah. Because, like, when I say that, it's true, but I'm still embarrassed. <laughs> oh, no. I, I mean, Bare Naked Ladies is kind of neither here nor there for me, but, like, nobody hates them, do they? I, I feel I, like it's I a know. fine band. Like the way I feel when I tell somebody who knows about music that mm-hmm. Bare Naked Ladies is my favorite band, I feel like it's the way I feel when I hear other people tell me like, "Oh yeah, I love comedy. Like Jeff Foxworthy's the best." <laughs> no, 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 no. Uh, that is, you're you're thinking of uh, the Dave Matthews Band. Really? Yeah, for real? <laughs> Actually, okay. no, Will to make you feel better. Seriously, coming from a guy who obviously knows something about music, you know, because you know. Um, Bare Naked Ladies next to Eric Clapton is the best show I've ever seen. Like a live show? Yes, I'm not even kidding. I would I would call the Bare Naked Ladies the kids in the hall of music, Canadians. Yeah. <laughs> okay. That's... All right. Who who else is on your um, list? Uh, probably Ben Folds Five. Love, fantastic choice, great choice. Uh, um, and Ben's and Ben Folds Solo is maybe better. I. Fucking yeah. love Ben Folds solo. But yeah, I, I, is that is that two spots? Ben Folds slash five. Yeah, I'll, okay. give t- I'll give you two. Okay. Um, Ween might be on there for me. I'm not gonna <laughs> like. That's not a joke. That's just real. I yeah. really, I really like just fucking off the wall, like oddball music from time to time. Cool. Um, and Ween is kind of fulfills that list. Who mm-hmm. else is? I don't know. God. Oh, I don't. You you may never have heard of him. He's internet famous, but not legitimately famous. But Jonathan Colton, oh, is up there for me. He did the fucking song from Portal, which is right. Right, Am that I is correct. That? That's the greatest song ever. Uh, still alive. Yeah. It, 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 it's the song that the computer that you destroy sings to you at the end of the game Portal. Uh, is it the first one or the second one? Um, he wrote the ending song to both games. <sighs> so good, Joshua. Hmm. <laughs> yes. Favorite. Favorite. Fav- one more. Do I have one? Do I have one more? I don't know. I mean, I mean, I'll just say Tenacious D because that's cheating. Yeah. It's <laughs> it's not school. I'm not grading oh. them. Uh, five favorite bands, Joshua. Um, I like uh, Kings of Leon. Mm-hmm. I like. There's a really good documentary about. I like them. Foo Fighters. Yeah. I like Cream, Jimi Hendrix, and other stuff. <laughs> I mean, I I, yeah. I, I, like, I like a lot of different. Kinds For of me, music. I would say Rancid. I love. Uh, I understand people don't like them. Uh, Vampire Weekend. Tommy James and the Shondells. Oh, it gets tough after this. Tom Petty, I like a lot. Uh, I'm trying to think of another band that are that is like one of my all-time favorite bands it's eh. hard it's hard to throw five man i mean <laughs> if you if you really yeah. like music and you 
you're going to like more than five, mm-hmm. you know. I will say Miles Davis. I, it sounds pretentious to throw that in there, but, like, I mean, I'm really into jazz. So I'll have to throw in some jazz in there. Is it too late for my fifth one? No. I'm going to go with uh, Phil Collins. Uh, not So not Genesis, but the solo Phil. Phil Collins or Sting, you can kind of, those are interchangeable to me. No, the, <laughs> what? <laughs> I almost said meatloaf. We have fans of meatloaf in here? Not the food, Will. I don't know. Man. Josh, I would have. I figured you like Randy Newman or something. I love Randy Newman. <laughs> I, I like too, I like too much about stuff. Randy Newman. Five, yeah. uh, and I would even. I was almost said Katy Perry, but then it's like, is it mu- is music to listen to? You know? Right. Is that even like, no. music? Uh, I she's know. fun to look at. You're talking about music to watch. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> well, like I think it's weird that you went Sting and Phil Collins instead of Genesis or The Police. All right, well, what I like that, too. You know what my favorite thing is about Phil Collins is The Living Years by Mike and the Mechanics. Wasn't he the? Wasn't he in Genesis? Is that where he came from? Or was he? Is that my right, He's Monty? Drummer. Yeah. He's drummer. Yeah. The Living Years by Mike and the Mechanics is one of my all-time favorite songs. That is a fucking great song. It's, one, it's on my list of songs that almost makes me cry every time I hear it. I don't think <laughs> Phil Collins has never done me like that. <laughs> oh. <laughs> I, have, I have one memory of uh, Phil Collins. Which is that uh, briefly in high school, I also played football before I learned my lesson. And when we were uh, when we were doing like the pump up thing before like the game would start, the big psych up song was "In the Air Tonight." Oh, okay. <laughs> and everything we would have to like we'd get dressed in the locker room, and then uh, they would turn off all the lights, and we would sit silently as "In the Air Tonight" played. And when it hit the part like. I think like it's like the bridge, right? And then it goes do 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 do. Oh, oh yeah. And then lights go up, and we're like, "Fuck yeah! Now we gotta get out of here." <laughs> That's what Phil Collins means to me. Love it, fantastic. <laughs> As you were saying that, Will, I was I was imagining all that in my head, except with you, like. <laughs> right. Obviously, I was just dressed like this. Yeah. Everyone else I, I was, was in football uniforms with pads and stuff, but you were just sitting there just quietly with your. Eyes closed. <laughs> I'm a 300 pounds, but still somehow smaller than everyone else in that room. Now that's a lineman for you. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, that's enough fun. Let's uh, <laughs> let's let's address some internet drama. The segment where we talk about stuff. <laughs> the stuff on this week's episode. Go ahead. You're Just like, getting in there close. I don't want to have to move fast later. You're down in your ver- <laughs> verbal three-point stance, <laughs> chopping your feet, <laughs> head on a swivel like a corner, coverage corner, a comedy coverage corner, alliteration. I'm. This isn't all still the same sport, right? <laughs> so the stuff I want to talk about this week is uh, this is being recorded on Monday the 15th, as we discussed earlier, maybe the 15th. I don't know. <laughs> and uh, so there's some there's some internet drama in the local Nebraska comedy community, and I, I felt like I should address it uh, on this show. Mm, I wanted to address it on this show. I don't feel the obligation <laughs> to do anything. No, no one gives a fuck what I have to say, but it's what I, it, it was, let's be honest, I didn't have any other ideas. It's time filler. So we have uh, a good friend, uh, Corey Brewer. We do a segment on the show where we make fun of his ridiculous Facebook posts, and uh, Corey got himself into a little bit of a tr- a little bit of trouble by making a post on Facebook that some people took out of context. Uh, a bunch of people piled on. Should I have named his name? Yeah, now you have to say what the meme was. Yeah, uh, somebody else explain it. I don't, I don't. Oh fuck me! All right. Uh, so the, he he took a picture. Uh, he he didn't actually make it. Somebody else made it, but he posted it on, s- spread it on Facebook. There was a picture of him performing stand up, which is a, a common thing that people do. Like, they they refer to him, I believe, on the Reddit as the stand up shots. <laughs> so slash Reddit slash stand up shots. I don't actually use Reddit. I don't know how it works. Um, uh, but it was a picture that's of him, and it said, uh, if I remember correctly, something to the effect of... I'm not racist. I once fucked a black chick. And then at the bottom it said, then I went back to fucking normal people. Now, let's be very clear. That 
that's stupid and offensive. Yeah. You know, and, and racist. And and racist, you know. Uh and and I'll and I'll say this at first. Corey is a good friend of mine and he's a sweet guy and he's not a racist. But he he is dumb. But but <laughs> well, Corey Brewer in person is just a sweetheart and he's a very nice guy and I've never heard him uh he's never done anything mean to me. But online Corey but Brewer But in fairness, you are white. On, <laughs> Boom! Nailed it. I let it up. <laughs> uh, you know, uh, but online Corey is sometimes a dumb child, <laughs> and he knows this. Corey is well aware of what online Corey is like. But <sighs> it, uh, some of the po- some of the posts are pretty fucking abrasive, <laughs> they, to yeah. say the least. <laughs> they they are they are. Here's. Here's what I wanted to get at, though. Here's the interesting part. I, it's not bag on Corey time. I've kind of defended him, and I sent out some private messages, and I totally understand why people are upset. I totally get it. But here, here here's the, what's interesting to me. So the Internet is a weird place, and the reason is that we can define our own countries. Like, there was a thing a couple weeks ago where there was a picture of Kim Kardashian's ass, and it was like, break the Internet, Kim Kardashian. And what break the internet means is this is the only thing that you're going to see if you're on the internet is stuff about this. And it's going to clog up everything you're doing. Well, that's true if you are spending your time online visiting sites where people talk about that. It didn't affect me at all because I don't spend time reading forums on Reddit or blogs on Kim Kardashian or whatever. I don't know. But... A lot of people, that's what they do. Like, I was listening to a podcast earlier today that was talking about a guy, an online, uh, an internet personality, uh, whose username is PewDiePie. Is anyone familiar with this person? I I believe it's pronounced PewDiePie. (laughs) Is that true? I honestly, I don't know anything about him other than that's the (laughs) reference I saw on the South Park episode about him. Somebody told me that he has 35 million subscribers to his YouTube channel. Sounds about right. Which makes him one of the most famous people in this country. What a jerk. I mean... I believe he's actually from Sweden. Whatever it is, it's like like him playing video games and yelling at the game or whatever. Um, But it's... That's a huge celebrity who I had never heard of until I heard him mentioned on the Cracked podcast this week. But I didn't know who he was. That's what makes the internet so strange is that, like, it's like in if you think back to 20 years ago or whatever, or imagine a time 20 years ago, imagining, like, a guy who was a huge star, like the most famous pop singer in Brazil. None of us would have heard of him. He's not here. But, like, over there, he's a huge celebrity. Well, that's what's weird about the Internet is that, a per- like, somebody, something can just completely take over an area of the Internet, and it can be all someone's world, all someone, like, sees in their world, and another person who lives next door to them can have no idea what's going on. Well, in my small Internet world, this kind of took over today, <laughs> I guess is the point of all of this, and a lot of our listeners are going to have no idea what I'm talking about, but it is just strange that... The things that I do online and the the what what I use the internet for today was just completely taken over by what I think of as cyberbullying and a bunch of people just being really mean to each other. And I think a lot of them had a uh, a point to make. I I don't think a lot of it. I, I mean, I think it started out with we're trying to do something that we feel is righteous and trying to correct a wrong that we believe needs to be corrected. But all that comes out when you're doing that online is just mean spirited, like attacks that don't do anybody any good. Uh, my question is, did you guys, how do you guys see that? Does it bother you? Is it just fun to read the forums <laughs> it is okay. fun it so, is it is a lot of fun I, I feel like, I enjoyed it I feel like we need to explain like even the, the situation even a little bit further sure so he put up this shitty picture with what was what I I will say as speaking as a, a friend of his was a dumb racist thing right um but it was what the way it came about was uh he he was drunk 
and he was going in to record another podcast. Uh, and before he did, he said some dumb racist thing. Right. Another comedian who heard him drunkenly say something like this made this picture in order to make fun of him. Right. Uh, which he then made the mistake of sharing further. Right. Uh, so that's. He, well, here, he, and here's the thing. Here's the thing about about Corey. Let's just this is this is what I'll say. Every single human being has dark thoughts, <laughs> has thoughts that we're not proud of. That if a telepath could read your mind, you you we all have thoughts that would be frowned upon. With Corey, there's just nothing stopping those thoughts from running down his neck, across <laughs> his shoulder, up his arm, and into a computer keyboard. It just <laughs> They come out. He doesn't filter what he puts online. He's not proud of it. He's not racist. But then rather than just be like, oh, guys, it was an honest mistake, he got kind of defensive and attacked back, and that's what caused it to spiral out of control. Because the other thing we all hate is the comedy police, right? Like, no one likes the comedy police. No one likes being told these are topics that are off limits. What I What I, what bothered me was not, it was the post. It was dumb. I just thought it wasn't funny. I've heard Corey say funny jokes. Like, he's a funny guy, right? And he's been doing comedy long enough. He's been doing it for two years that, you know, these people that were having this conversation about him online have known him for two years, but they never got to know him. They never appreciated any of the funny things he did. But as soon as he says one stupid thing, we're going to talk about that. Right. And jump all over the guy you didn't take any effort to to get to know him in the first place or take give him any sort of credit for any funny stuff he's done right so i mean just i don't know it doesn't seem and Corey Corey kills on stage a lot like he does really well he's not you know he Corey is not some inexperienced hack getting up there just trying to shock people that's not what he does He's actually a really good writer of jokes. And also, I'll say this. Fucking nobody I know loves comedy more than Corey Brewer. <laughs> like, nobody. That guy loves comedy. But Corey, I mean, I don't know. I mean, Corey Brewer, like, Corey Brewer knows what he is here. He's, I'm a janitor who farts a lot. Like, he knows what he is. <laughs> that was what he said on this podcast. And, like, there's, I think that if you have a point to make, yes. I understand. People shouldn't say racist shit. People shouldn't say sexist shit. But you're not going to save comedy by destroying a janitor in Lincoln who does one open mic a week. That You're not doing any good. You're just picking on someone who can't defend himself at that point, I feel. Right. Well, and that's the thing... That that's that's what draws that's what changes it I think in my mind from being something constructive to just being unnecessary useless bullying yeah. the way uh, the the way you said what what changed that was that none of it was directed at or to him nobody said anything to him they just posted this shitty thing that he had put up and all just fucking got into a big lather about it individually amongst themselves without ever saying like hey you you need to change your stance or your opinion or the way you behave right like if if there's any action in this that's like you want to try to behave or, or believe as though you're doing something to help others then you have to actually be trying to change an opinion yeah or a viewpoint right and that was i guess that was kind of my point is like Send him a private message and tell him that you think this was shitty and ask him to take it down. And at that point, he's like, fuck you, I'll do what I want. I don't know. Well, instead of doing that, how about talk to him in in person instead of posting it on Facebook? Because everybody's a a big man behind a keyboard and a screen. Yeah. You know, would you walk up to Corey and be like, you know, I don't really like what you did. That was racist. But again, yeah, that's not exactly what happened anyway. It was just. Right. It, it, what does that tell you? Well. What it tells me is is a couple things. Number one, even here's one thing that that I would say about it too: <clears throat> being right does not make it okay sometimes to attack people. Like, yes, it was racist and dumb. That does not make it okay to destroy a person. <laughs> I mean, also, 
there are bigger fish to fry. I think I think Corey's an easy target. And you know, if you want to do some good, if you want to save comedy, yeah, like these are things that need to be said. These are points that need to be made, but I don't know. I'm I, not picking sides. Um but whichever sides put puts me on a show, like <laughs> that's, that's the side of me. Yeah. I mean, that's everybody's side. <laughs> have you seen um, Have you seen stuff like this happen in the music community? Not so much the uh, with with the racist thing. I mean, you know, well, if, you're, if you're going about, around if you're right. going around writing racist songs, you're pretty much asking for it. <laughs> right, that's true. Well, and like Corey doesn't tell racist jokes on stage. It was one of not. thoughtless post online that he wasn't prepared to handle the consequences of but like i guess here's my question i I read this story recently about a band in new york some i don't know like guar wannabe band or whatever but Mm. they have some kind of following they played at a bar and part of their show was they they just spray blood everywhere and they used real animal blood and just sprayed it all over They, they spray blood on the crowd and you know fucking I don't know, idiots like that. So they went to this bar and they just sprayed like gallons of blood, animal blood, all over this bar. And the bar got closed down because like became a health code, health code violation. They couldn't clean it up. Now, who, who's, who, who should punish that band or should they be punished? Is it the local music community's responsibility to like say, hey, this isn't cool? Or is it, free market art in the sense that we should just leave it up to local businesses who will not give them shows anymore i mean i i think that's what we'd all like to happen right isn't that vandalism um it's it's crossing a line it's crossing a line and the worst the worst part about it is if you work in a bar which i do um you also and and playing and performing in bars being on tour which i've also done you learn there's this thing called a performance contract. I mean, professionals use performance contracts. These guys obviously probably aren't professionals. Right. Because they probably would have never done that. Right. Um, or maybe maybe they can, did. Maybe they would. I don't know. Can I interject into that sentiment? Yeah, they almost have to be professionals if they can afford the like equipment necessary to spray gallons upon gallons of animal blood onto a crowd. Right? Or maybe they were just oh, like, maybe. hey, you know Kiss? You know, so, you know he, has, he has the blood coming out of the mouth? Yeah. We do something kind of like that. <laughs> well, I've and seen like, people, yeah, sure. I've get I've seen people get their ass beat for less. I mean, in a, in a tell club us that story. Doing, well, you know, someone uses like some kind of nasty fog machine, and it like spits out some goopy shit on the stage, and then someone gets kicked out, like literally kicked out onto the street. But right, I think what where I was going with the performance contract thing is, if that's part of your show and that's integral to what you're doing. That's integral to your performance and selling your merchandise and your image and yourself. Um, you're going to have to okay that with the establishment first. And I guarantee you, no establishment would ever okay that. Right. So it's it's kind of the, it's what is, how, what's the old adage about it's easier to ask for forgiveness than ask for permission or whatever. I can't yeah, remember. Yeah, 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 that's right. correct. Yeah. So something like that's probably what it is. They figure, you know, if we had, if they had a big, what it was like 10 people there. That would probably would be pretty yeah. bad. Yeah, you know, uh, un- unclear. It, it's I. I don't know. I don't know the story, so I don't know if this was a publicity stunt or if this is just a thing this band. Well, does. sure it was. Sure it was. I mean, I, I mean, obviously it was a publicity stunt, but like I don't know if this is a thing they do a lot. You know, it just seems weird. Like, and I don't know if they just did this inside an Applebee's, you know, or it was a place like Dugan's, <laughs> which is designed to have bands there. But either way, like. Well, Dugan's was designed to have animal blood. But no, <laughs> right, I'm not right. kidding. The place used to be a chicken slaughterhouse. I'm not even kidding. <laughs> like, you can't make that up. I'm dead serious. Like, back in the, I guess, 70s or 80s, it was a chicken slaughterhouse. I'm not See, even kidding. That, we need to get this. We need to book this band, Monty. <laughs> yeah, yeah, probably not. Because somebody would wind up going to jail. It'd probably be me. Because, you know, I'm the steward of all that equipment down there. And if obviously, you got to think about the... I guess the cleaning of the blood that would be everywhere, that would be one thing if you were just, like, cleaning it off the walls. But if it gets into the equipment and what kind of legal ramifications you're looking at, what you're going to be held liable for right? due to having, like, say, a performance contract where it's in there. It says if you screw up our equipment, obviously you just bought it. Right. 
and you have to sign off on it. Now, a band that doesn't have, you know, a pot to piss in or a winner to throw it out of, and they're on tour, and they do something like that, I mean, how can you hold them liable? You're going to sue that band? What are you going to get, like, a cheese, right. you know, a chili dog from them? <laughs> right. They don't right. have anything. Right. They don't even have the chili dog. I mean, yet, they'll have it in a couple hours, but you well, know what I mean? Right, right. Yeah, I mean, they, they have several gallons of chili dog blood. I mean, they, yeah. I, I, I don't know. I But, like, I guess... To bring it back to you know our a more relevant topic, like is it the is it the responsibility of local comedians to to police ourselves to say, listen, what you're doing could potentially cost us audience members at other shows that you're not at. Like what you're doing could give our comedy scene a bad name. I I guess my opinion is I don't necessarily think that's what ha I don't think that really happens a lot I mean I don't think that I don't think that one comedian doing something in poor taste one time affects really anything all that much well that all depends on the definition of poor taste right I mean there's always a line and you know on one side of it there's empathy on the other side there's sympathy I mean you can't you can't police that sort of thing like you're saying but at the same time I think that as an active member of the entertainment community, maybe not the comedy community. I'm only active with the comedy community because of, you know, what, what we're doing down there right. on Thursdays or whatever. But, um, yeah, I mean, you take the guy to the side and say something about it, but who's to say what's funny and what's not, who's to say what's racist, and what's not. I mean, right. people keep pushing the limits of good taste. There I was, guess here's, I guess here's what I'm saying. I don't think that people hear about a band spraying blood all over a bar and say, well, I guess I'm never going to see live music again. Like, I don't think people go to see one bad movie and then just say, well, turns out I hate movies. Like, they just, I, most people just kind of move on. Like, I don't think that ruins the scene or hurts the scene really at all in any way. I, I, I know it feels like it does. Anyways, closing thoughts. Uh, I just wanted to address this. I don't want to take a side like Joshua said either. I, I think it was in poor taste. I, I think something... I understand it's an issue that needs to be addressed, but I don't think we need to be mean about it. That's my only point. I mean, the way I, the way I look at it is, I'm on Corey's side no matter what because I love the guy. <laughs> I do, and it's, I'm on his side. He's a lovable guy. I mean, you might like grab him and like shake him and say, "Dude, like I'm shake shake the booze out of him for a second and mm -hmm. be like, dude, quit being drunk, man.' Or like, maybe not. Right. Maybe not. I don't know. Yeah, uh, I I'm agreeing with that. Will I don't know. Uh, I, I don't want to be in the position of defending what Corey put on Facebook, because what Corey put on Facebook was fucking stupid. But I think that there's a danger here that I've seen happening where, like, the the comedy community has been a little bit too eager to form a, a mob in the past. Yeah. Um. I, I Something somewhat similar happened at a show I was at. Uh, another comedian friend of ours who was on the show runs Ryan Dowd um, did a joke where, okay, I'm, I'm just going to tell the joke that Ryan Dowd got called racist for doing. Um, he said, uh, I get it, black people. Uh, my or, uh, Elvis Presley stole rock and roll. All right, and then Eminem came and stole rap music. But damn it, Neil deGrasse Tyson, don't take nerdy star <laughs> shit from us. All right, that's all white people have left. <laughs> right. Except for being 99% of the world's billionaires and being able to get away with financial crimes. But basically, that's it. <laughs> Right. And he got called like and, and a bunch of comedians uh, like jumped on a bandwagon to say like he was being racist on their show because of that joke. And that to me is an example of them being so oversensitive to a joke that's obviously making fun of white privilege that I'm suspicious that they seem to just be motivated by wanting to be offended by something. That's you couldn't have said that better. That's yeah. absolutely true, man. That's just the way it is. Well, and, 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 and like I said, in this instance, they were right to be offended. Right. Uh, but there, there's still no good in forming a, mo forming a mob about it. Like, I would have, if I saw Corey had posted that, I would have gone, what the fuck is wrong with you? <laughs> right. I would have said something, but I would have done it to be like, hey, be better than that. Not, 
you know, we have to stop you from doing comedy. That's yeah. pretty much what I said to myself as soon as I saw it. And then, like, I got up and I flushed the toilet. And <laughs> Usually when I'm checking Facebook, that's... And, you know, man, I, I think you're right. Well, and honestly, the thing... I think people are just way too touchy these days, first of all. And second of all, you know, well, wait. Maybe that's my white man's privilege standpoint. You know what I mean? Maybe yeah. I think people are too touchy, but I... Man, sometimes when something's funny, it sometimes it can be racist, you know? Yeah. White people are not the only <laughs> racist out there, man. You right. know? Well, and Corey Brewer knows that. I just have a problem. He, <laughs> <laughs> he totally has a problem. <laughs> he Corey is well aware of that. I, I I don't know. It's the whole thing is just sad. Like no one's doing anybody any good. Uh, you know, let's just be nice and move on, right? Yeah. Or just hate each other, <laughs> or just have it out in the silently <laughs> among your own friends, <laughs> and then I'll talk about when you. How about these people you hate? Not on the internet. <laughs> like that's all you like you don't have to all be friends but like civility would be awesome you know whose fault it is facebook's fault that's whose fault it is zuckerberg yes it's his fault <laughs> <laughs> totally uh, fantastic once again it's the jews <laughs> <laughs> that's not racist <laughs> it's okay i'm jewish he's my co-host that gives him carte blanche Correct. <laughs> Let's do some news. Joshua. 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 Bossler. News. Hello, everybody. The Stamp Act of 1765. How about the Stamp Act of st Stupidity of 2014? Ooh, are we talking about stamps? Yeah. That's one of the stamps. I, I fucked up the end. I don't want to even do that one anymore. <laughs> Okay, uh, we're, we're going to leave the stamp story to your imagination, listeners. <laughs> oh, I'll Deal it. with it. It's quick. A 40-year-old uh, uh, North Carolina man was sentenced Thursday to two years in prison for bank fraud after writing more than $58,000 in bad checks for postage stamps. I'm really white. <laughs> Well, wow. so I guess what we're saying is the premise of Ryan Dowd's joke was wrong. White people can't get away with financial crimes. That's racist. <laughs> yeah, I did say it was white. He bu he bought a bunch of stamps with bad checks. Fifty-eight thousand dollars worth of stamps. Why? Uh, when his defense attorney was questioned about uh, him buying the stamps, his defense attorney wrote in court papers. That her client was abused as a child, loves to cook, and hopes to someday operate a food truck. Oh, man, that sounds like dumb white people. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but didn't have anything to say about the stamps. <laughs> I st Stamp fraud sounds like one of those things like using a telephone booth. Like, that doesn't sound like a thing that really happens anymore. Do you right? still use the mail? We've figured out better ways of delivering information right then stamps haven't we well i don't know if you know much about stamps he he bought fifty eight thousand dollars worth of stamps dude don't act like i don't know shit about they, stamps they don't hold their value every few years <laughs> um, the price they of were stamps, probably forever stamps turn around and try to oh, sell them forever stamps that's why they're so expensive <laughs> yeah you get some you buy you buy fifty eight thousand dollars worth of forever stamps. Next time they raise the price three cents, you just get them back on the market. Oh, that's a long term investment thing. God, so this guy's a genius. This is like at that time when it's always sunny in Philadelphia when they tried to buy all the gasoline. Yeah, yeah this is the reference to a TV <laughs> show. Do you have another story? Yes, I do. Do it. Let me have a Diablo sandwich, a Dr. Pepper, and make it quick. I'm in a goddamn hurry. <laughs> okay. <laughs> That's a quote from a movie. Um, what movie? Uh, a little movie called, um, uh, what, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> it's uh, it's uh, Smoking the Bandit. Oh. Right? Yeah. Anyways. Um, <laughs> Burt Reynolds, uh, memorabilia and, I and items from his personal collection, brought in $2.5 million at a Las Vegas auction this week. Where over seven hundred or six hundred and six items belonging to the actor were put up for sale by auction. Items including an eighteen karat gold. Oh uh, God, I can't. I just, fuck. <laughs> can't even read. He's not the best news anchor in the business for nothing, folks. I got I got damn physiology uh, final today. I've been up <laughs> since four o'clock this morning studying. Holy shit! How'd it go? How'd your final go? I don't know. <laughs> 
have no fucking idea. Uh, or care. You get to the point where you just, not only do you not know, but you just don't care. Boom. Nailed it. <laughs> Items included a 18 karat gold pocket watch that Sally Field gave him, his Golden Globe Award, and a canoe uh, made for the movie Deliverance. And uh, the biggest uh, sale item was his black 1977 Pontiac Trans Am, which sold for $450,000, which seems a bit high considering the car was only a promotional vehicle for the movie and was never actually in the movie. Uh, Reynolds insists that he is not broke. (laughs) Uh, Well, not anymore. Yeah. And then I found this other uh, quote. Let's hear it. Smoking the Bandit, which I found fitting, which he said in the movie, uh, for the good old American life, for the money, for the glory, and for the fun. Mostly for the money, though. (laughs) (laughs) I really wish I could have bought one of uh, Burt Reynolds' Golden Globes. (laughs) (laughs) What would you have done with it? I would have given it to my father for Christmas. (laughs) (laughs) All right, yeah. You know, I mean... What do you what do you buy the man who has everything? This is a yeah. This is a like I don't. Celebrity memorabilia is a I I don't know. It's a weird. I, I've never understood. I understand some collections. We've talked about this before, but like collecting like someone else's thing that they're that is famous because they owned it. Like you 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 know you see this a lot. Like this. This is a ten thousand dollar car, but it was driven by Paul Newman one time. So now it's a two million dollar car like why I, I don't understand that i mean i don't think if he drove it one time it jumps all the way to two million well like i just, feel like he's like your scent has to be still hanging on the interior the, if it's gonna be the auctioneers uh projected to get 70 to eighty thousand dollars for that car and well, they got four hundred fifty thousand. well he just said it wasn't even in the movie no like it was just like it didn't even have like burt reynolds probably never saw that car it was just a it was a promotional i i feel like the only way that happened is like they were just like there just happened to be two like rappers who were both bidding on that and then just getting competitive about it. <laughs> it's like an eBay auction has gone wrong. I'm like motherfucker, I have more money than you. <laughs> I I it rem- I'm thinking back to a time before authentication. Like there had to be a time, you know, where people were selling celebrity memorabilia. Like before we had things like <laughs> forensics and authentication, and no one thought like, well. <laughs> They're not going to fake a signature. Yeah. You could buy a crystal skull for $50,000 that was found in an, a- in, in an Egyptian tomb. <laughs> people bought that. Is, people and, are still and, buying shit like that. <laughs> I guarantee you there's still an industry for fake signatures. Oh, no, there is. But, like, most people are sort of aware today that that is something that happens. I it used to be the Wild West for that shit where it was just like, I'll just, I'll, I'll write the name. I don't know. Who was a celebrity in the year 1920? I don't know celebrity history. Charlie Chaplin? Yeah. You could just write the name Charlie Chaplin on on a, you know, a top hat. And be like, this is Charlie Chaplin's top hat. <laughs> so, you know, I, that's how they talked back then, right? Yeah, Charlie, Charlie Chaplin's hat. Would here's like, a, here's a, would you like to buy? Nice hat? Yeah. Here, you s- sell me Charlie Chaplin's hat, Josh. Hey, you look like you need a hat. I do. Oh, I just happen to have Charlie Chaplin's hat. Uh, it's not the weather for hats. Ah, oh, you'll get laid in this hat. Oh, what makes that better than a regular hat? Yeah, get some nookie. <laughs> <laughs> well, I don't know your term, future man. <laughs> what is this nookie you speak of? <laughs> and I scene. Oh, God, I told you. <laughs> and, and scene. I just want this to be over. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you for tuning in to the Jimmy Kerr Podcast. I hope you're. Go- I hope at that point, as soon as he says that, you're going to edit in the sound of a gunshot. <laughs> uh, I'll make that happen if I can. Uh, <laughs> if not, this conversation is really weird, and you didn't hear a gunshot there. But hey, thanks a lot, everybody. Uh, let's wrap it up here. Let's do some plugs. Who's got a plug? Who's got something they want to plug? It's your uh, well, if you're listening to this on the day it comes out, then uh, I am going to be along with my far inferior nemesis, Jimmy Putnam, <laughs> uh, at Agree to Disagree. Correct. Uh, where he's going to be on the side of organized religion. Well, we're, we are debating religious Christmas versus commercial Christmas. 
uh, in op- obviously I've already won in open debate. <laughs> well, that won't stop me from trying. Uh, what else? And uh, earlier that day, I'm on Pomedy, a comedy show to raise money to support some sort of pet charity uh, at the Backline Improv Theater in Omaha, Nebraska. That's at 8 p.m. And then Agree to Disagree is at Olivers. God, I don't even fucking know. Uh, at 9 p.m. So come out to see that. Uh, come to Dugan's every Wednesday and Thursday. Hop up on a stage. Try your hand at comedy or music on Wednesdays. Uh, do you have anything else, Monty, that you want to plug? No. Your band? I suppose. Do you guys, uh, do you have a band that plays around town? And no, I gigs? don't. That's that's why. There's there's really no <laughs> band right now. Actually, we're, we're in the process of uh, working on some music right now. Um, I've released, I have a couple commercially released records out there. You can pick up, uh, you can go to iTunes, you can download them wherever you want to get them from. Uh, awesome. You can, you can buy them in uh, some stores, you can get them on Amazon, whatever. Um, but we are working on a couple new records right now. I do have a guy in Texas who's uh, always been the guitar player for the Hanyaks. I kind of work in tandem with him. I have the bass player lives in Florida right now. He might be moving here soon. I'm really not sure. I just started working with a new drummer, and we actually tracked a song today. Um, it's it's more or less the bare bones demo version. I'll let you guys listen to it in a minute. You can tell me what you think. Hmm. But, um, yeah. Probably won't have anything to sell or push for a while. <laughs> All right, so just sit on your hands in nervous anticipation yep. of upcoming performances and uh, purchasable music from Monty Peck and the Hanyaks. Uh, and so I'm going to leave you with one of their songs. Uh, we we just listened to this here a little bit ago. This is super hilarious. Uh, I really enjoyed it. This song is called So Emo for Will Doherty. Ah, first, <laughs> Joshua Vossler. If you're interested in getting some nookie. <laughs> <laughs> and our very special guest, Monty Peck. Have a good night. Thank you very much. Thanks for listening. Have a good night. I walk around all day, staring at my feet. I'm always dressed in black. I don't give a fuck about the heat. Wearing my girlfriend's belt I'm so emo I should kill myself well, I painted my fingernails Feeling so forlorn And I squeezed into women's pants I just won't conform Nobody understands why my life is hell I'm so emo I should kill myself Please refrain from staring I'm not some kind